Welcome to Checking In, a Scottish Rite for Children podcast, where we'll share up-to-date expertise on children's muscles, joints, and bones. Scottish Rite for Children is one of the nation's leading pediatric orthopedic centers. Since 1921, we have been committed to caring for the whole child, mind, body, and spirit. Today, our world-renowned medical staff treats a wide range of pediatric orthopedic conditions, including sports injuries and fractures. Our specialists also excel in the treatment of related arthritic and neurological conditions, as well as learning disorders like dyslexia. Through outstanding care and compassion, Scottish Rite has become a place of hope. We are dedicated to beating the odds in the face of adversity because it's our mission to give children back their childhood. And now, your host, Jennifer Bowden. Welcome back to Checking In. I'm Jennifer Bowden, your host. And today we're here with Dr. Harry Kim and his nurse, uh, Kristen Odom. They are both experts in Perthes. So they are going to give us a great overview and a detailed breakdown of uh, all about Perthes today. Welcome, Dr. Kim. Welcome, Kristen. Thanks, Jen. Thanks for having yes. us. Thanks for having us. Why don't you get us started with um, just a, a general definition? What is Perthes and, and who is affected? So that's a great question to start off. So Perthes disease is a hip disorder in children um, and usually affects uh, children between the ages of two years to 14 years. So it's a very wide range. Uh, and it affects uh, more boys than girls. And that, that ratio is like four to one. So, and we don't quite understand why, but that's, that's how it is. And then we also find that uh, a lot of our children, especially boys, have uh, ADHD, oh. about 30% of them. So these are very active uh, boys that get uh, Perthes. That's very interesting, yeah. What, what are some important terms that uh, our parents should always uh, be aware of or understand when we start talk about Perthes? Because I know we have lots of special names and lingo that we use. Yeah, sure. That's, a, that's an important way to start off just so that uh, we uh, could communicate uh, well with this uh, disease. So it affects the hip, and then the hip is made of uh, ball and socket. So it's what we call ball and socket joints. So a ball... The medical term for that is femoral head, and then socket is called acetabulum. So Perthes affects the ball, which uh, for some reason, the blood flow or blood supply to that ball uh, gets disrupted or, or loses its blood supply, and that's how the disease is initiated. I'm guessing blood supply is important, right? Yes. <laughs> and then that leads to what we call necrosis. That's one of the terms that I think we should define, which just means death. So when we say osteonecrosis, osteo is bone and necrosis is death, is bone death. Gotcha. Yep. And then the other term I think uh, is, uh, some people get confused, is this term called reossification. It's actually two words. Re is the starting back. Ossi is the bone and fication is the, you know, new uh, remaking of the bone. That's sort of a way to okay. simply say that. Good. Thanks for clarifying that. That's helpful. Uh, talk a little bit about the disease progression. You know, what happens to that femoral head, the ball, and what are the different stages of Perthes? Right. So I like to think of it as four stages, as like uh, four bases to a baseball. Um, so it, um, first stage is when the blood flow uh, gets uh, disrupted. So that's the stage, what we call it, uh, necrosis, stage of death. And then it will progress to stage of fragmentation, and that's when the body tries to heal the bone, but the femoral head, the ball, is weakened, so it starts to break down. And because the body is also trying to remove the dead bone, it looks uh, very disorganized, and the head uh, starts to collapse, which means to flatten out, lose its round shape. Uh, so that's the second stage. And the third stage is the reossification. So the body then, after removing the dead bone, start to build back the new bone. And that's the reossification stage. And then the fourth stage is when it's all healed. Uh, we call that healed stage. Okay. What, what causes Perthes, Dr. Kim? Can you kind of talk us through that? So that's a $1 million or more these days, because <laughs> millions and, you know, uh, isn't much these days. $1 billion question, because no one really knows. So it's what we call idiopathic, which is uh, it's a term we use when we don't really know what's causing it. We know what happens, which is the loss of blood flow. We don't know what causes that blood flow to uh, 
get disrupted, but we do have some theories. So one of the theories is, is that child's very active and uh, we don't know exactly when it happens, but the blood flow gets uh, damaged or the head sort of gets injured, but not to an extent that you have a fracture or break in the bone, but because of the activity of the child's that it it may perhaps uh, stop the blood flow. That's one of the theories. And then there's, uh, there are many theories over the years. Okay. Could, uh, could children be born with it? Is it a genetic, a genetic thing? So that's one of the most popular questions that I get. Is it hereditary? Is it passed down from you know, uh, father to son? Does it run in the family? Uh, and in majority, probably over 95% of the times, there's no family history. So there, it doesn't seem to be genetic. But we do have patients where, you know, father had it and then son has it or, you know, one sibling had it and another sort of gets it. Uh, and in those cases, it may be Perthes, but uh, we need to make sure it's not some other condition that mimics Perthes because there are some genetic disorders, what we call it multiple epiphyseal dysplasia, that could mimic Perthes. And in those cases, I think it's warranted to do genetic testing to make sure that it's really not Perthes, but that sort of could mimic Perthes. I see. Okay. When you do have a patient that has a parent that you suspect Perthes uh, in their parents, do you guys examine that parent? Do you guys get x-rays on that parent? So that's a good question. So we get pretty extensive history. So um, we want to make sure that it's not passed down or there's some uh, family history that will sort of you know, sort of inform us that this is uh, some other genetic disorder. So we, we do talk to them. And if the parents actually have Perthes, I'm very interested in using seeing their x-rays, like father's x-rays, and see how, are do how they are doing. And I do have uh, several uh, patients with that family history. And, you know, father had a hip replacement already and so on. And, and it's also uh, for the uh, academic and research uh, purposes, it's, it's good to sort of have uh, that kind of history because perhaps these patients do have this very rare potential genetic cause for Perthes, and we like to study that. Okay, that's very interesting. Kind of walk us through what are the symptoms of Perthes? What, what are the most common symptoms that you see in your patients? Yes, yeah, so a lot of the patients get picked up because they're limping. Because in, in general, children don't complain very much about pain, but pain and limping are the things that usually bring, uh, you know, parents or somebody uh, sort of observe a child limping, and, and that's sort of the reason for the referral for us to uh, see them. Now, regards to the pain, children sometimes cannot tell you exactly where the pain is coming from, or even though it's a hip disease, they'll be complaining of thigh or knee pain, which really confuses everyone. And that delays the diagnosis. So I have uh, many patients who will complain of knee pain, and they end up getting knee x-rays and sometimes even knee MRI uh, to find that they, in fact, have Perthes disease. So I think it's very important for parents to know that in children, when they complain of knee pain, uh, you, you still need to uh, make sure it's not coming from the hip. And that usually requires a good history and physical examination. Can any of those symptoms that you talked about, do they get confused with other hip conditions like hip dislocations, hip injuries, anything like that? Yes, very often uh, you have several conditions that could sort of mimic Perthes disease. One of the more common one is called transient synovitis of the hip. So for reasons that we don't know, you get some inflammation in the joint and that causes uh, pain and limping and some children you know, will limp for uh, a few days. Uh, but the important thing is that Perthes will linger over time, whereas something like transient synovitis, uh, after resting and with some anti-inflammatory medication, it will go away so that it doesn't continue to recur. So if the pain persists or is getting worse uh, or doesn't respond to this kind of rest you know, for a few days and so on, then uh, I certainly think that the child should be seen by a pediatrician, and then after that, a referral to a pediatric or speak surgeon if uh, they think it's uh, Perthes. Okay. Okay. Good to know. Talk about, you know, when a patient comes to see, comes to see you, Dr. Kim, how, how does your team diagnose Perthes? The diagnosis of Perthes requires us to make sure that it's not something else or due to uh, medications. You know, things like uh, corticosteroid, which is prescribed for 
inflammatory conditions or even some uh, childhood cancer could cause Perthes like uh, uh, features or findings. Uh, so we take a good history to make sure that this really is not something else. And then we do an examination to assess the hip as well as the knee to see that specifically it's the hip that's the problem. And then diagnosis of Perthes requires x-rays because it's not just a clinical diagnosis, but it, it requires diagnostic imaging. And in some patients, uh, especially older patients, and when I say older patients, usually children over six, uh, we would order an MRI, and specific MRI called perfusion MRI, to really try to assess how severe the disease is uh, and to try to get some uh, idea of whether an operative treatment uh, would benefit this child. So we would sort of take that kind of... Uh, uh, systematic approach to making the diagnosis as well as uh, um, analyzing what's going to be the best treatment. Okay, you talked earlier about, um, you know, blood flow to the ball of the femur, you know, the femoral head to the ball of the hip. Uh, is that what you're looking at with the perfusion MRI? Can you kind of talk about a, the perfusion MRI a little bit? Yes. Yeah, so uh, before we start to do perfusion MRI, which was really pioneered through our work here at Scottish Rite, uh, we didn't really have a good idea on knowing how bad the uh, la loss of blood flow was. So with the perfusion MRI, which involves giving uh, uh, MRI contrast, you can see where the blood flow is and where it's lacking. Uh, and more loss of blood flow, then the healing would take longer and more severe the diseases. And, and in those patients, we tend to uh, favor more of the operative treatment because uh, there are some studies that show that uh, that's more effective than non-operative treatment. Why do you think it's so important for our patients to see a pediatric orthopedic specialist? Like, why wouldn't a pediatrician be able to treat this? That's a great question. So, Perthes disease is a very uh, uncommon condition. So, even a pediatrician, even orthopedic surgeons or sports medicine doctors would not usually see this condition. So it usually gets filtered eventually down to pediatric orthopedic surgeons. And even pediatric orthopedic surgeons, I think it's important to know that, uh, you know, most will see maybe one or two cases a year. So I think if you had a choice, you would want to see somebody who has a special interest in this condition and who see uh, more of these patients. Uh, and that's why we... And we're going to talk about this uh, later about the International Perthy Study Group. And also for parents to know uh, which pediatric orthopedic surgeons have special interests in this condition. We'll be right back after this. To receive the latest news from Scottish Rite for Children, patient stories, videos, blogs, and more, follow us on social media. Through Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, we share inspirational stories and educational resources for you and your family. We're back to checking in with Scottish Rite and your host, Jennifer Bowden. What can a parent and, and a patient expect when they are seen by your team for birthdays? Kind of walk us through the clinic experience. What happens when, when they come to clinic? So we try to uh, provide a, a comprehensive assessment. Uh, and a lot of our patients actually come for a second or third opinion or have already seen uh, you know, other specialists. Uh, so we, we try to take an approach of being able to take time do a thorough uh, history and physical exam, uh, get the imaging that's required, or we will go and review all the ec previous x-rays or MRIs that's been done previously. We also involve um, assessing children, not just from the point of view of the disease, but how they're feeling. So we've implemented this thing called uh, PROMISE, which are questionnaires that's uh, related to a child's anxiety, uh, depressive symptoms, uh, their peer relationships, so social, you know, social as well as psychological aspect of the child. So we try to uh, get an idea, a handle on that. And in some children, because it's a chronic condition, so it's not like a fracture where you, you know, break, break a bone, put a cast on, heal, and the child goes back to playing, you know, normally within a few months. This, this is a condition that takes months and some children years to sort of overcome. So 
there's a lot of that other aspect that you don't see in a relatively simple condition. So we try to approach uh, the whole child uh, from a physical, psychosocial, uh, and also uh, from the point of view of uh, recovery. So physiotherapy uh, is usually involved. In some children, they will need to have uh, a wheelchair, so we would get uh, get that as well, crutches, walker, whatever is appropriate for that child at that stage of the disease. Okay. You mentioned, you know, a, a kind of a chronic condition, long-term condition. How often, you know, do your patients come back for clinic appointments? How long do you guys keep seeing them? In general, we see uh, patients back every three months, but... Um, if it's sort of in the early stage, and what we found find that is it's the early stage is really most important in terms of getting handle on the disease and trying to prevent the head from collapsing or deforming. So in those patients where um, the motion is decreasing or you know, a child has pain and has an irritable head, we would see them back even sooner, like a, a month uh, or you know, six weeks later. But once things have sort of get established, then it'd be every three months uh, for first uh, year, year and a half. And then we sort of, as the healing uh, uh, is going well and the recovery is going well, then we'll spread the visit to once a year, once every two years or so. Okay. Let's jump into uh, treatment. Kind of walk us through some of the treatment for Perthes. We can kind of start with um, any non-operative treatment that you guys provide, meaning it doesn't need surgery. Sure. So I think the treatment is uh, really controversial in a way that there's really no one best treatment for Perthes. And so this is one of the things that's really frustrating for parents because they'll go see one uh, physician and one treatment is recommended. They'll go see another uh, and that's something completely different. So, you know, one uh, surgeon would recommend non-operative treatment and another will uh, recommend surgery. And then they'll come and see us and then, you know, we may have another uh, opinion about it. So there are non-operative as well as operative treatment. I think it's important to just point out that there's no one best treatment uh, that works on everyone. So it, it's important to look at the child, stage of the disease, where the child is in, in terms of the range of motion pain and try to uh, come up with a treatment that is best for that particular patient versus trying to fit one treatment to everyone, which really usually doesn't work. And this is where I think, uh, you know, um, seeing an orthopedic, pediatric orthopedic surgeon who is able to treat both non-operably as well as operably is very important so that, you know, you're not seeing somebody who's always treating uh, regardless of age of the patient or the stage of the disease or where the child is in terms of the, uh, the, the progression of the disease just with one treatment. Mm -hmm. So you tailor, tailor your treatment plan to each patient. Yes. So now just to go back to the original question about, so what are the non-operative treatments? So that would range. And initially at the early stage, because we're trying to prevent the deformity, we would start off with uh, what we call weight relief uh, treatment, so that using crutches, walker, a wheelchair if needed to try to decrease the amount of impact that's placed on that hip because the hip is getting weaker as it goes from stage one to stage two. And stage two, what uh, we call the fragmentation stage, is when most of the collapse occurs. So, you know, at that stage, I, I, I think the weight relief type of uh, uh, treatment, I think, is important. And at that stage, we also would get additional imaging to see if we should persist with uh, non-operative treatment or would the uh, operative treatment be better. Okay. What about cast or bracing? Do you guys use any cast or braces for treatment of perthes? Yes. Yeah, so for uh, certain patients, I think, especially if the motion really has been affected. So we do see children who are sort of in the stage two or the fragmentation stage where the hip is really not moving just because it's been irritated and the head has deformed. Uh, and in those cases, I think uh, a casting followed by a bracing treatment uh, works well. So you would start with casting and talk to us about what type of cast you use for Perthes. So the, one of the sort of the established casting treatment is called Petri casting. The, the name Petrie comes from uh, Dr. Petrie, who started this treatment back in 1970s. Uh, and it involves putting uh, both legs in a cast 
with a, a bar or two bars in between to spread the legs. And that helps to rest the hip, especially some of these uh, children are very active and they're not able to rest themselves. And so this uh, allows them to rest as, uh, at the same time, increasing the hip motion to be able to spread the leg out, which then helps the, the ball, the, the femoral head to be contained in the socket. Okay. And the casting is it's, uh, six weeks. Uh, and then that's usually followed by a brace. Uh, but in certain patients, uh, uh, we offer an operative treatment instead of brace. Okay. And is it they're casted with their legs straight out or are they casted with their legs bent? So it's usually with uh, straight out. And uh, I think we must have a picture of it in our website if, uh, so that you can understand. Or we definitely have published papers on it as well. So. Uh, but it is spread out. Okay. And do the kids, are they able to walk in the cast? So they're able to stand and walk short distance. Uh, but I don't recommend that they use this cast uh, to walk because the head is weak. And one important fact to recognize is when you walk, you're putting about two and a half times the body weight through that hip joint. So you know, a few steps is not a problem, but if, if an active child would usually take about seven to 8,000 steps, and you can see seven to 8,000 times you're putting two and a half times your body weight through that uh, femoral head. And that's why over time the head collapses, deforms, and flattens out. Okay, that's a great explanation. That's a great explanation. The other thing I just want to say is the walking on it also irritates the hip and makes it stiffer because... The hip is telling me, telling the uh, child that you're doing too much, but it doesn't actually register to the brain uh, to know that. So there's a disconnect, and that's the other important thing to recognize. What's happening in the hip doesn't get registered to the child's brain. So the child, you know, wants to keep playing. He wants to do soccer or do, you know, whatever that uh, uh, they like to do, whereas the hip is saying too much is being done. And then you can see that through the decreased range of motion and also flattening of the femoral head. Do you feel like the, the Petri cast is a good visual reminder to slow down? <laughs> it, it certainly will. And, and we don't use it in every patient, but in certain patients. And that's the, the point about selecting patients and selecting treatment that is best for that patient for that particular stage or range of motion uh, or age. I oh, see. That makes sense. That makes sense. Let's uh, talk a little bit about surgical treatment for Perthes. You know, what, what type of surgeries do you perform to, to fix Perthes? Yes, good question. So the surgical treatment could also range from something that's uh, relatively uh, minor, such as lengthening uh, a tendon that is uh, tight, which is preventing from spreading out and moving, and that's called adductor tenotomy. And it involves like a small incision that usually require one stitch, uh, you know, minimally invasive type of surgery. Uh, with that procedure, that's when we would usually then put the child in a cast in the operating room to in improve the hip motion. More uh, involved surgery would be what we call femoral osteotomy or pelvic osteotomy. That's where we actually uh, cut the upper part of the thigh bone to angle the head more into the socket to, in a way, protect it. But uh, that surgery also has, you know, a couple of other effects, which is to uh, improve the compliance of the patient. I find that when a, a child has had a, a major surgery, the child definitely decreases the activity and listens uh, uh, sort of uh, better in terms of the, the activity restrictions and so on. And also cutting the bone close to the ball where there's blood flow has been lost. Uh, it seems to stimulate the regain of the blood flow to some extent. Okay. Is the type of surgical treatment, is it determined by the age of the child? Uh, absolutely. So, you know, there are studies, uh, and some of these studies were done uh, at Scottish Rite, that uh, show that if a child has an onset of perthes before age six, most of these patients don't need uh, any treatment and certainly not uh, operative treatment. And when I say most, probably about 80%. So there are like the other 20% that uh, may require treatment, but majority of patients don't require specific treatment. Now, when you move up the age, though, uh, patients, uh, especially over eight who are in the early stage, it seems that they do better with operative treatment. And in patients who are even older, so uh, 
over 11 years old, then the treatment also changes from that kind of osteotomy to more of my current recommendation is to make uh, channels by drilling through the uh, femoral head where there's no blood flow to increase the channels for blood uh, vessels to invade into that area, as well as uh, injecting uh, stem cells that you get from the uh, child's pelvis. Oh, wow. Okay. So you actually make a place for blood to flow through that bone. Yes, uh, as well as trying to introduce some new cells with uh, a healing potentials to speed up the healing process. Wow, that's very cool. You're listening to Checking In, a Scottish Rite for Children podcast. Do you have a story to tell? We want to hear it. Sharing your experience with us can provide inspiration to other patients and shine light on our mission of giving children back their childhood. Whether you are a current or former patient or family member, we invite you to share your journey with us. To submit your information, visit scottishrightforchildren.org forward slash share your story. Welcome back to Checking In, a Scottish Right for Children podcast. Uh, you know, and leading into resources for parents and families, you know, let's go, kind of go through some of the um, frequently asked questions that you get from your patients and parents. And we'll loop in Kristen Odom, your expert Perthes nurse, in some of these questions. You know, talk to me about patients who come from out of state. You know, I know we have several Perthes patients that travel from very far. Kind of discuss the logistics, you know, of, of how they get here for treatment. 50% of our patients come from out of state, and this is not just uh, just around Texas, but we have patients from California, Florida, and I've had uh, patients as far as from Israel and Hong Kong, uh, and uh, currently have also patients from Canada. So I think it's it's uh, um, it really is a logistic and practical sort of uh, uh, issues that, you know, uh, those things come up. But, you know, we're just blessed to be able to um, provide answers to a lot of these parents. You know, the reason why they come from so far is because they are not able to find the answers or someone, uh, you know, takes the time to explain what is going on. And usually, uh, you know, each of these visits could be one hour or sometimes longer. And I'm so uh, blessed to have Kristen helping us because she's really developed the expertise and communication sort of uh, skills as well as know how to address all these uh, logistic uh, issues that come up, especially when you're coming from uh, far. So, Kristen, please. Sure. Yes. Thank you. So we get all kinds of uh, patients that call us from out of state, internationally. They usually contact myself or Dr. Kim directly um, for second, third opinions. So we just... I reach out to them and find out their information and get their records and imaging. Dr. Kim will usually review that. And if it definitely, you know, is Perthes, then we bring them in. And here recently, we've been able to do the telemed visits as a second option for these people traveling from so far. Um, But those are our two options. And, you know, we allow them to come in person to here to Dallas or uh, to set up a telemed visit. Um, And we just reach out to them and help coordinate that. So if they are coming in person, you know, there's different accommodations that we help set up, like their air travel, um, discounted hotels in the area. So I just kind of help communicate that to them on how they can easily get here to see Dr. Kim. That's super helpful. It's nice that you guys are team up and review things ahead of time so that you're well prepared for their visit since they're traveling so far. We've also made a a video on how to take care of your uh, child when a petri cast is, let's say, placed or um, after surgery, because those things could, you know, having your legs in a cast could uh, definitely make it harder to uh, transport and, uh, you know, get around. So, and, and Kristen is also uh, very good about providing information about, you know, the uh, how to travel in a car as well as uh, uh, in the airplane. Right. So, yes, so that's a good point that you make, Dr. Kim, because the out-of-state patients, they have to go home at some point, right, Kristen? Correct. <laughs> yes. So once they get here, they do have to go home, and it's sometimes in this Petri cast, so it can be very challenging. But just educating the families on what to expect before they even get here is so beneficial. Um, when they're here with us in clinic, we do have an interdisciplinary team 
a group of physical therapists and occupational therapists who help make all that a lot easier for the families. So that there's so much to consider once they are in these casts, you know, what kind of size car they have. So when they do get home, they have room to put their kids in this car for transportation. And if stairs are in their home and then just small things like adaptive clothing that they're going to need. And as long as all that is educated to the family beforehand, it just makes the process so much smoother for the families. When you talk about clothing, do you guys teach them how to make their own clothing or do you provide clothing for them? Yes. So there's lots of different types of clothing. You know, there's buttons and zippers and Velcro. So I usually have some examples in clinic so that they can actually see it, feel it, touch it, let the patients have their say in what kind of things that they want to wear. Um, Occupational therapy is really good as well. Sometimes they have clothes there to hand out to them, at least one pair before they're actually here so that they can have something. And you help facilitate travel back and forth, you know, for follow-up visits, cast removal, brace fittings, all of that, correct? So they come they come back and forth several times. Correct. Yes, they do. And a lot of these kids in the Petri cast, they need more than one seat on an airplane. So we help get that all set up. Social worker is involved in that as well on helping the families have more than one seat on their way back. Um, and four, so that they're comfortable on an airplane ride because it's definitely challenging. Yeah, good to know. Yeah, that's good to know. The parents, I think the families, you know, that it's so important for them to feel supported <laughs> when they're going through this right. journey that they, they don't have to figure everything out for themselves that, you you know, you guys will yes. be there to help them uh, and through all of that. It's usually a, a, these kids do really well in the cast. It's a lot scarier, I think, for the parents right. just to try to figure out all the logistics of, of caring for their child. Right. Uh, what what about long term issues with children that have recovered from Perthes? You know, to, to kind of talk about that. Are, are there long term issues? Yes. Yeah, so uh, it all depends how the femoral head heals. So uh, the femoral head or the ball is supposed to be round, but not all patients will heal with the head rounds, and some will end up with so, so called mushroom shape or flattened head. And it's those patients who will. Uh, be at risk for developing arthritis later in life. And depending on how severe the deformity or the flattening is, uh, then the risk uh, uh, will change. Uh, And in addition to that, how active the patient is. So, Because some of our patients are active and they remain very active uh, after they recover from Perthes. And some of them become very uh, high-functioning or high-level athletes, uh, you know, who compete. Uh, And in those patients... There is an uh, increased risk of developing arthritis, and uh, we will usually follow them until they're done with growth, and sometimes even in their early 20s. Is this a condition, is Perthes a condition that should be followed by an orthopedist into adulthood? Yes, yeah, so uh, some of these patients, we will bring them back you know, after they're uh, mature. Uh, because they're at risk for developing symptoms related to the mismatch of the, you know, the mushroom-shaped head to the socket, or because they're at risk for developing arthritis. And we also have a sort of combined uh, clinic with an uh, adult uh, hip surgeon, Dr. Joel Wells from uh, uh, UT Southwestern, uh, in what we call the complex hip clinic to uh, manage uh, more of the more complicated uh, cases of Perthes, especially, you know, patients in their adolescence or young adult age. I see. Kristen, do you feel like you get a lot of phone calls from adult patients that have had Perthes before? Oh, yes, we do. We get a lot of uh, patients just looking for the next step. Dr. Kim's opinion on where they should go now that they are an adult um, and what the next step would be if they are having problems. Mm-hmm. And are you guys, do you help kind of triage through that and work together to get them to the next step? Yes, yes. We just kind of talk to them and try to figure out, you know, what they're needing at this point. And Dr. Joel Wells is a great resource for us to use as well. That's excellent. One one of the things is, uh, you know, we get uh, patients contacting us from all over U.S. and sometimes other parts of the world. And unfortunately, we can't provide because we don't know. Uh, all the different places and who are the, you know, the best uh, hip surgeons out there. So uh, I, I don't want people to be disappointed when, you know, we say we just don't know in, in that area who is the best uh, adult uh, hip surgeon to consult. Um, the other thing I want to just leave, uh, you know, this podcast with is that at least 50% or more of a patient will do well so that, you know, the parents who 
sort of uh, have a child who's just been diagnosed with Perthes, you know, they won't have this kind of uh, very grim view that everything's, you know, things are not going to work out because we do have uh, patients who do very well and, you know, they, uh, they well, do well during their adolescence and uh, don't require any further treatment uh, or require long-term follow-up. Is there an average recovery time for Perthes? So that's a great question. Uh, so, you know, we talked about the four stages. So usually the stage one, which is a stage of necrosis, lasts about six to eight months. The second stage fragmentation is eight to 12 months. And I just want to tell uh, parents that this is the stage when most of the collapse occurs. So this is probably where the most active treatment should be focused on because what we want to do is we want to prevent the head from collapsing. Because once the head collapses, especially in older patients, it's hard to get it back to a round shape again. And then depending on how severe the disease is and how collapsed the head, the third stage duration varies uh, a lot. It could last uh, a one year to five years, especially if it's a severe perthes with uh, you know, major collapse of the head. It tends to be slow in terms of rebuilding back. And that's why some patients will go through perthes within one to two years and some will take five or more years. Uh, I see. Okay, that's a good explanation. So uh, as with most things, you would say early intervention is always best? Yes. Okay, so if there is a concern, parents and families should reach out sooner rather than later. I agree. Okay. Yes. You know, we've learned so much about nutrition, uh, uh, you know, over the years. Does nutrition play a role in the recovery from Perthes? So, yes, we like for them to, you know, have a well-balanced meal. So if there's things that the, the child is not eating, then Dr. Kim will recommend, you know, vitamin D and just overall multivitamin, you know, supplements are, are always best. But there's not one thing that they can take that will definitely cure this or, or necessarily help. Is a nutritional workup part of your Perthes treatment? So usually uh, we, uh, we go through uh, patients' weight, height, and get the BMI. And, uh, and, and a lot of times parents would ask about nutrition. And just like Kristen says, I think uh, for a young child growing uh, for the bone health in general, vitamin D and calcium is very important, I think. But if let's say a child is uh, overweight and has uh, a poor sort of uh, nutritional uh, habit or, you know, uh, is... It needs some education, then we will get uh, a dietitian consult to go over, you know, their uh, nutritional sort of needs as well as how they could help try to maintain uh, uh, their body weight. Because when you get the disease, num uh, the amount of activity is going to be restricted, what you could do. So a child who's been very active uh, is now at risk for gaining weight. Uh, but once, well, the other thing that we found through the IPSG uh, research is that, yes, you may gain weight, and not everyone does, but once the disease is over, that uh, weight is usually sort of comes off. So we don't uh, particularly get fixed on the weight. I understand. So you, t you talked to just a second about research. Kind of elaborate on that, Dr. Kim. Kind of tell us what kind of research is being done at Scottish Rite regarding Perthes. Um, you know, I know we have the International Perthes Study Group that you mentioned. Can you kind of tell us what, what that is? So, yeah, so I'd love to talk about research. And there's been so much research that has uh, been done at Scottish Rite. As uh, people may or may not know, we are the leading center of Perthes disease research in USA and probably of the world. A uh, number of papers, uh, articles that have come through this hospital is, is just uh, tremendous. And this uh, work started from our uh, previous chief of staff, Dr. Tony Herring, and we are continuing with that work. And our research goes down to a very basic science level, trying to understand the disease and understand uh, what uh, are the key uh, processes that's contributing to the femoral head from uh, collapsing and not healing properly. So we're, uh, through that research, we're trying to develop new treatments, more innovative treatments to um, improve the healing. And one of the more recent studies that's been published uh, just uh, recently is understanding uh, what we call inflammatory proteins that's involved. And one of them is interleukin-6 or IL-6. And we uh, have now done studies using a drug that counteracts the uh, interleukin-6 and found it to improve the bone healing. So through that kind of research, understanding 
the factors that are contributing to the uh, disease progression, we're able to now uh, come up with potential treatments. And so the next step will be to initiate some kind of clinical trial to see, in fact, in children with perthes, that kind of treatment uh, works. Very interesting. Dr. Kim, can you tell us about the International Perthes Study Group, uh, or IPSG for short? What is IPSG? Sure. So IPSG is a group of pediatric orthopedic surgeons from all over uh, USA, and now probably eight to 10 other countries that have come together to really try to collaborate to understand what is really the best treatment for Perthes and try to uh, improve our knowledge of it. The reason for this uh, kind of multi-center collaborative effort is because, as I've discussed, it's a rare condition. So, you know, each center will only have limited number. You know, even though like Scottish Rite, we probably have the most number of patients uh, in the United States in terms of the volume. But it helps when you have a large number of surgeons from different uh, places to contribute, and that usually speeds up the enrollment of patients and the uh, knowledge acquisition. So we formed this group about eight years ago, and currently we're the leading center, and uh, we store the data from these patients, and uh, we are constantly reviewing the data and doing studies to address uh, questions that come up. And w one of the study, one of the really the uh, primary question that we're trying to address is what is the best treatment for different age groups of patients with Perthes disease? Do you feel like IPSG can serve as a resource to our families that have uh, you know children with Perthes? Yes, absolutely. So we have a website called uh, PerthesDisease.org, just as uh, I've sounded out, PerthesDisease.org. And in that uh, website, we have uh, areas where we provide educational sort of information about uh, Perthes disease and treatments and, and so on. And we also do uh, uh, occasionally Facebook Live, especially with uh, other social support uh, groups uh, for Perthes to try to disseminate information about Perthes because there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding as, mis as well as misinformation about Perthes just because it's an uncommon condition. And uh, what we know is not really widely disseminated. So we try to provide that kind of more up-to-date information to parents. Okay. Can you talk a little bit more about what Scottish Rite's involvement is with the Perthy Study Group? So, um, as I uh, discussed before, we are, we are really the uh, leading center of Perthy's research as well as for the uh, IPSG. So, you know, it's been great that Scottish Rite has supported uh, our research efforts through uh, providing uh, various resources to make that possible. And that includes, you know, we have our annual IPSG meeting at Scottish Rite every year, uh, and uh, it's been just uh, tremendous to have the, the support from Scottish Rite. That's good. That sounds like a great resource for our families that you guys provide. Well, Dr. Kim and Kristen, thank you so much for joining us today on Checking In. It, it's so apparent that your expertise and your passion for Perthes is um, present in your care and your approach to all of your patients. We really appreciate you talking with us today. Absolutely. Thank you, Jennifer. Pleasure being here. Thanks for uh, having us. Of course, you know, if, if you have any more questions or need more information about Perthes, please visit our Scottish Rite website. Thanks for being with us today on Checking In, and we'll see you next time. more information about any of the topics discussed on today's podcast, check out our website at scottishrightforchildren.org. And be sure to subscribe to Checking In with Scottish Right. This podcast is a production of Scottish Right for Children. The host for this episode is Jennifer Bowden. Our producer is Maggie Dingwell. Our editor is Amy Krajewski. Our assistant editor and recording engineer is Stuart Allman. Our theme music was composed by Scott Holmes, and his music can be found at scottholmesmusic.com. Thanks for listening, and we look forward to seeing you at our next episode.